again, happy Biovisibility Day, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to be co-chairing today along with Lindsay, who's here, and um, myself on behalf of the Staff Pride Network. I am the um, bisexuality rep, uh, or the bi plus rep, as of this year, um, which is really exciting and gives me the opportunity to host something like this and get to meet lots of other people who might uh, identify as bi plus, who might fall outside that umbrella, but be part of the LGBT plus community, or who might be allies themselves. Um, everyone's welcome and we can't wait to hear all of your perspectives today. Um, obviously today is a day for celebrating uh, bi plus identity, uh, very much so, and kind of highlighting um, our experiences and making ourselves visible. Um, I'd just like to say up front that I super appreciate you guys tuning in, uh, as I know that uh, the Zoom fatigue is real right now. And if your day job involves sitting at a screen all day like mine does, it can be hard to motivate yourself to do something social uh, after work when it's just more staring at the screen. I can very much relate after uh, a day on the computer myself. But um, if you're living in the UK, you might know that we are looking at some more restrictions in the next couple of months so that these events are even more important than ever so that we are experiencing that solidarity digitally, if not in person. Um, and that's that's pretty, uh, pretty helpful, I think. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, co-hosting co is Lindsay from Our Story Scotland. And uh, Lindsay, I don't know, would you like to uh, give a little bit more of an introduction about yourself and what you do with Our Story Scotland? That would be great. Yeah, of course. Uh, Hi guys, uh, I'm Lindsay. I'm one of the volunteers with Our Story Scotland. I started volunteering with the charity in February as a research intern when I was completing my master's in gender studies and I wrote my thesis about bisexuality uh, and I used all the research material from Our Story Scotland to write my thesis. Our Story Scotland is a small Scottish charity, it's run totally by volunteers and they collect, archive and present the LGBT stories of people all across Scotland, whether you're a native, whether you've moved here, basically just trying to make voices heard in as many ways as possible. So we typically do face-to-face -face interviews, either one-on-ones or groups. We've done interviews with the Pride Network before, um, but unfortunately, of course, that's not happening at the moment. So we're doing a couple of new projects right now. Our newest one is called Queer Distance, which is focusing on not only the physical distance everybody is experiencing right now, but also the social distance and the emotional impact that this has had, especially on the LGBT community, obviously in the sense of found families and every other aspect to it. Um, I think it was linked in the email, of course, that if you want to look at these different projects we're doing right now, but um, you can basically write a wee diary entry, write an episode, fill in a questionnaire, part of the questions we're going to look at today. And yeah, we basically just want to hear from people and especially the bi community, which is so often overlooked and the bi plus as well. So yeah, that's why we're taking part in it. And as the wee bi, the wee baby bi in Scotland, I'm the one that's been tasked with the event. Today, so hi. Yes. And I think we spoke about this briefly, Lindsay, in that we were both um, in terms of confidence talking about what it feels like to think of yourself as a baby bi. And, uh, trying to um, talk yourself into believing that even if your experience is what you feel like a little more limited in terms of years, it doesn't make it less valid, I guess. Um, I know that we'll probably have people here who might even be at the questioning stage or who might just um, use that identity in general because, you know, labels don't work for everyone. But um, yeah, that's where we're both coming from. So we have that in common. I'm sure a lot of you will have that in common as well. I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Um, before we introduce our interviewees, I'd just like to give uh, Helena Norman, who is the um, Pride Sock Bi Officer, the opportunity to join in. Hi, Helena. How are you Hi. doing? Hi. Not too bad. Hi. How are you? Yeah, not bad either. Thanks so much for joining us today. And um, We'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, what your role involves in Pride Sock, um, particularly in your student-facing role. 
Um, yeah, so I am Pride Sox um, buy and pan officer um, and also the mental health and disability officer, but that's a, a different thing. Um, yeah, um, so usually um, my role uh, includes a lot more sort of organising group hangouts for um, by plus people um, and also people who are questioning just to, you know, just as like an informal, friendly, open space for, for anyone to um, just come and hang out. At the moment, of course, that's not possible. Um, but we're still trying to create these environments over Zoom um, and do things like just like virtual movie nights um, with with people who are by and pan. Um, but we also do a lot of um, uh, more sort of activism stuff, especially about we just did a myth busting um, uh, presentation. Um, to do with bisexuality and pansexuality um, just because there are so many misconceptions um, about bisexuality that it's it's not real that I don't know you're making it up I don't know any like there are so many misconceptions and I think that's one of the most um, harmful things that especially as as a, as a privileged white bi person in Scotland that is one of the most harmful things that me and a lot of my peers face. Um, so we try and tackle that across campus and try and um, make it just a more inclusive space for all um, bisexual, pansexual people and people who don't fit those labels and people who want to self-identify with different labels. Of course, yeah, really well described. And it's great to hear that you're pivoting so many things to an online format uh, to continue supporting the student community in particular. Um, that's really cool. And uh, yeah, those myth busting sessions are always valuable because there's always more to learn about what may or may not be um, true or representative or factual, um, particularly for people who fall under the Bi Plus umbrella. So that's great to hear too. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for chipping in there, Helena. I don't know if you'd like to perhaps leave um, some links or maybe some further information or contact details for any students who are joining us today um, if they'd like to get in touch with the Pride Sox separately. Yeah, of course, I will leave those in the chat. Um, and great. anyone is welcome to any Pride Sox events. Open to, open to all. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Helena. Um, we'll move on now to um, introducing our interviewees. Um, just before I do that, what I will do for everyone who's attending is give you a quick rundown of our schedule, uh, just so we're all on the same page of what we can expect um, over the next kind of hour and 20 minutes. Um, so we're thinking of um, putting five questions to our four interviewees. Uh, these are questions that are actually taken from the questionnaire that's part of our Story Scotland's Queer Distancing Project. Um, and it's one of a um, couple of methods that the Queer Distance Project uses to um, collect information that it is um, archiving and using for research, um, which is super interesting. We're going to use those five questions this time. Um, our four interviewees are going to give us a short uh, two or three minute answer to each question if they're comfortable doing so. Um, obviously, we'll have to see how we're doing for time. We might have to skim over a couple of questions. Um, a little faster, but we'd like to give the opportunity at the end of each question to let all of the participants uh, who are attending today to pitch in, either by raising your hand if you'd like to add a comment aloud in the discussion, or adding your comments in the chat as well uh, would be really, really cool. So uh, see what you feel like here. Um, we're going to give about 15 minutes per question, so that should take us up to just before um, half past seven today if we're looking at our five questions um, yeah I wonder um, actually Lindsay when we have a, a minute or two do you want to tell us a bit more about the queer distance project in particular um, yeah of course do you want to go over it now or um, I guess just a bit of a summary to maybe give us a bit of a background of where the questions that we're going to be looking at today have come from and what the kind of intention of the project is in general? 
Yeah, of course. So um, Queer Distance was our founder's idea. So it was Jamie's idea, who's not taking part today, but he's usually the mastermind between all behind all of these things. And uh, Queer Distance was they basically the entire purpose of it was to try and bridge that gap that existed because of the lockdown and because of COVID. And it was about exploring how not being able to interact in say like community spaces has impacted the LGBT plus community. Um, the questions that they've picked are, I would say usually ones that tend to come up in the face-to-face -face interviews that we do. So mm -hmm. whenever we interview, either if it's an individual, if it's a group, we typically just begin with the question of asking the interviewee to tell us a little bit more about their early life. And of course, typically your early life starts with where you grew up and how your school experiences were and everything like that. So obviously the questions are kind of catered towards the kind of things that naturally come up in the conversations. So I'm pretty sure I haven't asked Jamie personally, but I can imagine that that's where his inspiration for the questions have come from. Um, and in terms of the episodes and the diary entries and things, it's mostly just to see how LGBTQ people, I think, take up space and how they observe space. So whether obviously with the observations, like it's looking at maybe things like how we notice heteronormativity existing in the world. And it's, it's basically just trying to get people's opinions and letting voices be heard that aren't often heard or are often ignored deliberately is pretty much the purpose of the project. Sure. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. Uh, thanks for a little more detail there. Um, so in that case, I will go ahead and briefly introduce our four interviewees. Um, their names are Zara, Jimmy, um, Siobhan and Georgia. Um, I, will, uh, I think it's best if we go in that order when we're going to each question, if that's OK with you guys. Um, so if you'd like to um, uh, pop on your video and audio, if you're comfortable doing so, and just give us a line or two of an introduction about yourself. Um, hi, Zara. How's it going? Hi. Um, can I go first? Like, my name first. Um, yeah, you go ahead. Awesome. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Zara and I am a, uh, a PhD student at the IGMM, the Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine. Um, so I'm in my, uh, I'm just going into my third year and uh, um, I, I'm studying human genetics and I'm bi. <laughs> plus, bi plus, I suppose. Um, yeah. Great, that's awesome. Thanks, um, Zara. Jimmy, would you like to give us a brief introduction as well? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Jimmy. Um, he, him, or they, them. I'm also at the IGMM um, and the Cancer Research Centre, the Western General Campus. I'm married with two kids and my older kids and I were both diagnosed with autism in 2017. That's interesting. Thanks for telling us about that. Um, Great. Uh, Georgia, would you like to say hello? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm being a bit of a wuss and keeping my camera off, but I've, <laughs> I am here. <laughs> hi. Um, I actually work at the um, ISG side of the university, so I'm based in information security. Um, <clears throat> I've been working at the uni for over a year, but I've only just joined the Stafford Network recently, just be purely because of time. Um, but I know Jonathan from, um, and a couple of others, I think, from working in informatics. Um, I am also married and have two children. I've luckily managed to barricade myself upstairs away from the the family. So having a nice wee lesson in peace and quiet just now. That's great. Glad to hear it. Um, we all need a bit of a rest uh, these days in particular, I think. Um, so Siobhan, last but certainly not least. Um, please give us a little intro about yourself. Hi, I'm Siobhan. I am uh, I, I'm an administrator in the School of Informatics. Um, when I'm not in the uh, Staff Pride Network, I'm also the co-chair of the Disabled Staff Network and a writer. Um, I write poetry and prose and things like that. And 
in normal times I perform that various places um not so much right now and um yeah I'm I'm not married with children I'm very single but I'm really happy about that <laughs> That's great to hear. And we can't wait until we can hear you performing your poetry and prose again. So do let us know when we can expect Thank to you. hear some of that. Yeah, um, I have two cats. It's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same, but it's, mm, sometimes it feels pretty close when you have cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you guys for the introduction. Um, so when we uh, pop to each of you for um, a short answer to each of our questions, we'll go in that order. Um, we'll go Zara, Zuri, Georgia, Siobhan, if that's okay with you guys. Um, oh, I think Zara's dropped out, but I'm sure she'll be back any second now. Um, so I might kick us off by asking the first question, and then Lindsay will ask the second one. We'll go every second one like that. Um, and the first question, if I have it in front of me just now, um, is a good one. What kind of place did you grow up? e.g. village, small town, city, do you still live there now? Um, so to kind of warm us up a bit, it might help if uh, Lindsay and I answer this question first um, in, a, in a couple of sentences. Uh, Lindsay, where did you grow up? Yeah, I am born and bred in Edinburgh. Uh, I've moved from Kirstofen to Leith, I'm now in Gorgie, so I've been in different places in Edinburgh, but pretty solidly in Edinburgh. Uh, I lived in Utrecht in the Netherlands for about six months, and that's me, like, just Edinburgh-based, always. <laughs> that's a lot of loyalty, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a good city, you want to stay here, you know, so. Mm -hmm. and what about you, Cathy, where do you grow up? Well, um... You can probably tell from my accent, I'm not Edinburgh born and bred, personally. Um, so I am from Cork, which is the second city in Ireland. Some of you might know of it. Um, I say Cork as a city, but I'm actually from a town that's kind of a suburb outside of the city. I think it's an equivalent to Musselburgh to Edinburgh, if you can imagine that. Um, and I guess trying to think of these questions like through like a bi plus experience lens. Um, I would definitely say that having grown up there and just moved out of Cork uh, following my finishing my undergrad was the only time that I really started kind of thinking about my identity and, you know, really trying to kind of put a name on it or say, hmm, maybe this is something we can look into now. Maybe it's a good time. Um, I moved from Cork to Edinburgh in 2016. That was the, about the time that um, things started kicking off in my head, like, what's going on here? Um, uh, girls are also attractive. That's crazy. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm sure some of you can relate. Um, so, uh, Zara, would you like to uh, let us know where you're from? Yeah, um, yeah. this is actually probably the most complicated question to answer out of all of the ones on the thing. So the, the short version is um, lots of places. Um, I was born in the US and then uh, moved basically a lot between here and there, but mostly was in the UK from when I was about six um, and have lived in lots of different cities, mostly like cities and university towns. Um, and I'm not ethnically from either of those places, so that's the whole thing as well. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I came to Edinburgh to start my PhD in 2018. Um, and before that was in London and then did my undergrad in Bristol. So that's the, the, recent, the recent one of, of many. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah, mostly towns and cities, no, no countryside. <laughs> cool. Um, great. Uh, Jimmy? Where are you from? Yeah, so I, I um, was born and grew up in rural Somerset. I uh, spent my primary school years um, living in a like a council estate, but uh, it was kind of built next to a village rather than next to a town or a city or something like that. Um, so yeah, fields and and it was the eighties. Um, so, so yeah, it was. There were a lot of strange attitudes back then. I can tell you. Um, so I. I as soon as I was able, I moved away from there as far away as I could, which turned out to be Glasgow. 
and I studied there for um, my degree and my PhD and then moved across to Edinburgh in 2004 and now live in a village just south of Edinburgh which is very different from the village I grew up in I have to say <laughs> very different <laughs> that's great probably good to hear um cool and uh Georgia do you want to tell us where you grew up um yeah it, it has quite a lot of similarity with uh, Sarah actually because I've moved around so much <clears throat> um so I was born in uh, Glasgow in Scotland lived there for a few years moved down to England for a few years lived back in Scotland again um, when I was 13 moved back down to England again uh, <laughs> so it was very much up and down the UK um, and when we moved down to England we, we I spent a, quite a few years in my sort of high school years um, in a, a quite a small village um, and I had I have to kind of say as well there the school I went to had particularly negative and very narrow-minded attitudes um, I remember being 14, 15, and some of the things I would hear um, them talking about, even changing uh, for PE and things, um, they would, you know what children are like at times, but I remember hearing people saying, oh, she's gay, blah, 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 and they were such negative things. They would pick on other girls in the class, and it was just, it was really pretty horrid. Um, but it wasn't until I sort of reached about 17, 18 that we, we moved into a more sort of sixth form-ish um class and that was when it started, suddenly be became more of a sort of actually look how different everyone is look at this diversity look how great this is and it was as if this attitude just completely changed and a, f a few of my friends came out and then it was very much like very 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 open-minded which was great because I'd never understood it before then I couldn't understand the negative like narrow-mindedness of some people I still don't but I have to say, like, I've noticed in the last, what, 15 years, the, the change. Um, and then I moved up to Edinburgh when I was 18. And to be honest, I kind of class Edinburgh as my home because it's where I met my husband. I, I've had my family and it's the city that I, whenever I go away, I have to come back to because I miss it. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Having moved here, yeah, just just over four years ago now that it's very easy to call Edinburgh home pretty quickly. Um, I'm sure some of you guys can relate to that too. And um, Siobhan, uh, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Scotland? Siobhan, can you hear me okay? Shall I start again? Oh, can you hear me yeah. now? Sorry, I, I, I'm not sure, was that just me? Or did it no, I think, I, think, I, think I think I wasn't working. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Yeah, um, I was born in the northeast of England, and uh, but I moved to the southeast when I was about uh, five and moved to a town called Bracknell, which is one of the commuter towns outside of London where they took people from they cleared basically the slums of London and moved people to towns like Bracknell and that's where we came from. Um, it was mostly concrete um, and yeah quite small-minded again. I went to a convent school in Slough um, and uh, yeah uh, was often told that I was like gay for Kylie or gay for specific girls and didn't really understand that um, and didn't understand it because it was also clearly meant to be something that I should be ashamed of or upset by, particularly given that I was at a convent school, so very religious. Um, and um, I've pretty much never gone back. I am I went to uni in Leeds and moved to London for a long time and moved to Edinburgh about um, six or seven years ago. And I, I do know from people who've stayed behind that attitudes have changed for a lot of them there but it just didn't feel like anything I could ever go back to yeah I can I can understand that but um it sounds like you're in the group of us who are calling Edinburgh home now oh yes nice. it's home it's where my flat and my cats are <laughs> yes <laughs> that's that's where home is um great um those were really interesting points I wonder if any of you wanted to add to 
add to that with a particular kind of lens on the by experience. I know some of you mentioned, you know, what kind of it was like growing up, especially in school and stuff. Um, and I wonder if anyone uh, who's in our audience uh, would like to comment on anything that's been said there, if it's something that you can relate to, if it's something that's quite different from your experience, um, it would be really interesting to hear um, if there are any comments on that. So um, if you'd like to weigh in, feel free to raise your hand or write in the chat just now. Okay, for Kylie, um, you're you're not the only one, Siobhan. Um, <laughs> Vanessa, um, that's nice. Uh, that's nice. That that's something that you can relate to the um, marriage with kids people expressing their bi identities. Um, I think that's really important and really great to hear. You know that um, bisexuality doesn't end with a uh, marriage in a heteronormative relationship. Um, that's something that I have to kind of bear in mind as well. Personally, I've been in a, um, a straight passing relationship for four and a half years. And, uh, you know, um, I'm quite straight passing in a lot of my life. I kind of, I, I am aware of that. Um, but it's things like this that remind me that I can express my identity uh, in the ways that I like and can feel included. I'm the same as that. Like I'm, I've actually been in a straight passing relationship for four and a half years as well. Um, and as much as I'm not married with kids, like that has made me like doubt my own bisexuality at certain times, which is stupid because that's not how it works. Um, but like, yeah, it's definitely, uh, and I've spoken to other bisexual people about that as well. It seems like quite a universal experience. Like if you are in a in a straight passing relationship, then it makes a lot of people see you differently, I think. I completely agree with that as well. Like even I've been with my husband, um, even just being being with him in a relationship for nearly 11 years. And it's the assumptions that are made so often um, by people because I, I I don't, I, I would never conceal it about myself, but I just don't really discuss it predominantly because of family reactions I've had in the past. Um, I still have quite a sort of um, nervous disposition whenever it, it's brought up around certain people anyway. Um, but it's definitely something that people would assume, oh, but you you, you must be, you must be straight. You're, you're married to a man, you have children. It's just not true. And I think that's definitely something that needs to be broken. That kind of assumption needs to be changed. I think it's difficult. I feel like there's so many stereotypes surrounding bisexuality and bi plus sexualities that the second you don't conform to those stereotypes, people just don't really believe that you are that sexuality. Like, how do you prove it? Because if you have a partner of a certain gender, you're instantly one or the other, and it's it's difficult, but I think opening discussions about it and proving that sexuality is more fluid and not just this specific thing you can fit in a box, I feel like that's kind of the only way we can really start to tackle it and to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I dated a, a fellow, I seem to, not deliberately, but I dated a fellow bisexual and um, when she came out as bisexual, everyone assumed she meant gay. And um, because she was dating a woman at the time, it was assumed that that meant that she'd picked a side. Mm -hmm. And it's we, we, who we're with doesn't define our sexuality. That's not how it works. Exactly. Um, there's a comment there from Javi. Yavi. Sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, that's probably echoing what you're saying there, Siobhan, that um, it's it's pretty common to be defined by who you're with um, and you have to kind of actively work against that. Um, I know that even as uh, people who are queer and try to recognize that, I, I still need to work on it myself. 
um, all the time. I think I think it also can be an issue in sort of date dating worlds where I find that um, sorry to move right on but I can find that um, a lot of lesbians think that I'm not really into women that I'm secretly into men not all there's just a small subset who are like oh you don't really mean it um, and then the the sort of uh, cis straight men are all like oh what do you do with women and it's sort of like oh <laughs> no I'm, I'm not I am genuine and I'm not here to be fetishized <laughs> sorry, that. sorry that um I would like seeing that the chat is teeming now with people uh venting and expressing their frustrations um because we're in a space where we can be super open about it and just uh, kind of rant and say, oh, this is affecting me all the time. And I feel like people here, if even if they don't understand it, they're open to understanding what it's like, uh, what it's like to be me. And um, this is really nice to see. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm conscious that we, we might be getting ahead of ourselves a little, and it would be really nice to go through the questions uh, that we had prepared. Um, but please, Keep chatting in the chat. This is uh, this is great stuff. Um, Lindsay, if you'd like to, or if you'd like to make any other comment before moving on, um, I think you have a list of questions in front of you as well. So feel free to fire ahead. I'm really interested in this one because I think my plus labels really topical right now. But question two is how would you describe your gender and sexual orientation? Uh, so we'll just go say order that we went for so we'll start with Sarah. Um, so gender is easy um, and as much as I've like put a lot of thought into it I'm pretty sure I'm a cis female um, so that's a that's the easy answer the more complicated one is um, sexuality because it's uh, so I've always outwardly identified as bisexual like if anyone asks me I will without doubt say that I'm bisexual but if I like examine that a bit more closely i think i'm probably most closely aligned to what people would describe as pansexual um in that like gender doesn't pay any like part at all in my sexuality and my sexual orientation and like how i'm attracted to people um but when i was i think i struggled with my sexuality for a really long time and um i like once I kind of came to terms with it, I felt um, much more aligned with bisexual as a label because it had like a community and a history and like language to describe it. And at the time when I came out, it was some, it was, you could tell people that you were bisexual and most people at least have an understanding of like what that's supposed to mean, even if it's stereotyped or even if it's like not accurate, like people know that word. Whereas, people didn't know the word pansexual, like even in some LGBT circles. So um, yeah, I, I will always say I'm bisexual, but actually there's probably like more to it than that. Yeah, I think I really strongly relate to that as well, especially when I was conducting my interviews for my thesis and everything, it was definitely the case that using by whether or not that's the label that fits you the most is the one that's recognized the most and it's almost the easiest way to kind of open up that conversation with it. I think recognition is really important and obviously I think that like things like the visibility days are so critical to increasing knowledge about it. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Jimmy, can we go to you? Um, yeah, hopefully I didn't click on the wrong thing there. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, it's something I've changed my opinion about over the years. Um, uh, I, I once quite firmly identified as bi and then I had this crisis of confidence uh, that, that I didn't deserve that, you know, like what you were talking about before because I've, I've been in a, um, what did you call it, a straight passing relationship, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, since I was 19, um, it's, it's 22 years now, so um, yeah, and, and gender as well, I, I mean, 
it's just really confusing. I find it really confusing. Uh, and on one day I'll, I'll be totally sorted and the next day I'll, I'll just be really confused again. And so um, I was recently reading ab ab about questioning being a firm identity that you can adopt. And I think it suits me really well, like even beyond sexuality and gender it question it, um suits my uh, approach to life i think <laughs> so yeah That's me. and georgia uh, yeah so <clears throat> like the others i've i've been to be honest you know thinking about everything over the years um when i figured out about myself when i really kind of went oh okay i'm into women too um, it was in my late teens um, and at that point not, not really from a kind of community of friends around me but generally from a family point of view um, I was raised to think you know labels are bad all labels are bad and um, this person in question would quite happily use the term gay and was very open-minded however when I actually tried to come out and say I, I'm pretty sure bisexual. Um, I was met with, uh, oh, but you do say things for attention. So that that really marred my kind of um, identity, I guess. I, I was made to think for years that, oh, I, I have to just keep quiet. I can't label myself. I can't put myself in that box. And it was horrible. And it's only been in recent years that the sort of, I've been thinking about all this. I've had friends who've um, been gender diverse and I've learned more about it. Um, I am fairly sure, although I do believe it can be very fluid, like some others have said, but I, am, I, I believe my, in myself. I'm happy to say that I'm cis female. Um, when it comes to sexuality, though, it's taken me years to get to the point. I, I went between bi, went to pan, like as I was saying earlier trying to understand what did by mean that there was a binary thing there and like Siobhan was saying I've I've kind of got to that point where like but that, but that doesn't that's not what it means and to me I will now say I'm, I'm happy to say I'm bisexual because to me it doesn't mean one or other in a binary state it's to do with feeling attraction sexual attraction to multiple genders and I I don't really think of myself as pan just because I don't know enough about all the types of all the different genders, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, are we are we done with question two? Um, I've not answered. Am I missing someone? Siobhan? Yeah, I was, I was like, I've missed somebody out. Siobhan, go for it. Um my gender is meh. that is uh how i would describe it um i don't know something um i'm not cis but i'm not anything i don't know um i was always told i was too much like a boy growing up or too much like this or too much like that and so i did a lot of work to sort of reclaim the idea of womanhood as something that i could be um but it's never fit comfortably but i don't know what would so having so that's that's it basically um and um my sexuality i say bye it's easier everyone understands it and again i think it's not a binary thing um i i would say it's more irrespective of gender which some people say is pan but I like who I like based on who they are. That's that's the short that's the longer but it's a person, not anything else. Yeah, I think it's in there. Oh sorry, oh, Liz. <laughs> Just wanted to echo what Siobhan said in that I really like the idea of thinking of each other as people rather than by gender. I feel like we've gotten to that point. Like it's 2020, we can we can think of each other as, as more than boys and girls, I'm sure. Um, there's um, a great collection of essays that me and Lindsay mentioned um, called The Bible, uh, which is super clever, um, that I go back to time and time again. I think it was published by Monstrous Regiment, who are actually based in Edinburgh. And um, 
there's a, a quote from one of the from one of the essays in there that just says very simply, I didn't pick a side, I picked a person. And that that just really stands out to me and I keep coming back to that that one line. I really like that. I had a similar experience when I was interviewing people for my thesis and I interviewed one guy who identifies as bi and he was 50 plus and he was saying like he'll always identify as bi because it's a bloody banner like there's so much like con so many connotations to the label and he eventually just said he's like labels are for soup cans like we don't need them for each other but we need them to be recognized by others and I think he's I think it, it really resonated with me I was like personally I don't really care about a label for myself it's like Siobhan saying I like who I like but it's nice to have something at the same time that you can say this is me recognize me and notice me I think it's that really difficult balance especially for something like bisexuality where you don't really fit into one category or another yeah I feel the same I feel like as much as like I don't really and like everyone seems to have different opinions about about how like bi and pan and other like sexualities under that umbrella relate to gender and because gender is such a big conversation that's happening right now it can get kind of messy when you talk to people about this and people get right really defensive about their labels or about other people's labels and it's kind of like I like bisexual because it it like I, I didn't have a queer community growing up I didn't have queer friends I didn't have like, and I felt very lost, like, not having that, like, while questioning myself. So, like, finding that community and being able to do things like this, like, events under that label and, like, having a community of people that have obviously not the same experience but similar experiences is so beneficial for, like, your own identity. So, yeah, like, it doesn't matter what other people think of you. Like, you need to choose your labels or, like, not choose labels if that's what you're into. But if you like labels, then labels can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think um, someone in the chat said the same thing. Katie said it's empowering to when you when you find the label yourself, and that to me is is completely it. It's taken me to into my thirties to realise that, but I do now. Also, that book is fantastic. The Bible. I've read both volumes, and they're great. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Amazing. Are we ready to move on to question three, Kathy? Yes, I think so. Um, we might have a minute or two to ask anyone who's attending if they'd like to chip in on that question. Um, I know it can be a little bit daunting and it's nice to be there without your audio and video. Totally agree. Um, but if anyone's feeling brave, we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to raise a hand and chip in um, or to uh, provide a comment. Um, I see Sabine might like to chip in there. Um, let me check. Oh, yeah. You're Hi. Ready to Sabine. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to to chip in in like the how do you define your sexual orientation kind of question because like at one point in my life I actually made a, like a bar plot of gender distribution of people I was attracted to like I I approached it in really like the nerdy scientific way of making a huge list of everybody I was ever attracted to to find out like what is the distribution over like the gender continuum. So yeah, I, I definitely I am bisexual. <laughs> But I, I felt like for myself, like the, the urge kind of because you get so much of this, like, oh, you're making it up for attention. It's like, okay, am I actually making it up for attention? And then just like testing myself that way. So, yeah, just wanted to share that. I love that approach to trying to dash, a, trying to add dashification to, <laughs> to something that is so nuanced and complex um, in, in trying to understand it. I can totally relate to that. Um, and that's, that's really creative. Maybe I'll try that for myself. Um, I'll just need to um, write down people's names on that sheet of paper and burn it afterward, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I desperately want to go away and make a bar graph now. That's a fantastic idea. <laughs> but yeah, no one can ever see it. It just needs to exist. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, uh, would anyone else like to add to that? Um, Katie appreciates my use of the word dashification. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> my, legs are, my legs are currently like pretzels under me. So uh, you can see looking respectable up here, but I'm definitely like five years <laughs> thing down here. It's a very <laughs> <my> <laughs> people. <laughs> <laughs> do we know about the bi chair you know there's a bi chair that someone designed for their daughter because she I, sits... saw that. <laughs> I need one of those I, I think I'm doing a similar thing like my legs are crossed like once but then a second time I, I'm sure that's not healthy or like useful so where does it come from is it just part it's, of me is it who I am um it's also hypermobile, but generally it's a, it's um, the, as I said, um, I tweeted today that my favorite cliches about bi people, one of them is that we sit really weird, that we can't sit. It's, one is that we're super socially awkward. Another is that we love puns. I love oh. the little random. <laughs> Very that. Yeah, it's a necessary part of your exam to get your bi certification. So uh, you yeah. have to be. You have to be scored on on how weird you can sit in any given regular job. Yeah. Um, what, what else is this? you said to me, Siobhan? Cuffed jeans, sitting weird, making puns. Cuffed jeans. Yeah, yeah. maybe some dark oh, jeans. Yeah. You've got you've to lean into them, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, it, it's one of my friends said that she felt, um, actually Lisa, Lisa Marie Furler, who wrote the um, article, the, the, the essay that um, uh, Kathy was talking about, is very, very femme and doesn't like wear jeans and stuff and when I was talking about bisexual ankles you know <laughs> how we all get <laughs> she was like this doesn't make me a bad bisexual that I always wear tights I'm like no it just makes you fem it's fine <laughs> that's gonna be the bible volume three is just I like to sit in chairs weird and wear calf jeans <laughs> <laughs> I always have cool ankles yeah. sorry no, we've we, got... should pitch this. we should pitch this to the editors um <laughs> Let me hook you up. <laughs> Can we do that? that? <laughs> Sorry, we definitely me. got signed. <laughs> and if anyone would like to check out the chair, that might be perfect for you. Um, I don't know if this is uh, materialism at work, but thank you so much for sharing, Katie. Um, <laughs> you can check out <laughs> the perfect chair and try and replicate it if you need it in your life. Um, yeah, um, I, I know I'm very much steering things away, but um, it'd be really fun if we could cover all of our questions. So I might move on yes. to question three. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a question that might be a bit sensitive, so I'm not going to ask everyone this. Um, and I think uh, of you four uh, that are present at the moment, um, maybe just raise your hand or kind of butt in if you'd like to answer this. Um, the original style of the question in the uh, questionnaire is, let me make sure I quote it correctly, um, what were the best and worst things that happened to you at school? Um, so obviously they can get a bit heavy if we look at the worst side of things, right? Um, I know that school wasn't fun or uh, very uh, uh, empowering for a lot of people. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start off on a lighter note and drop in my two cents of the best thing that happened to me at school. Um, in, in school in Ireland, uh, you finish primary school um, when you're 12, when you're 13. So you go into high school at 13. And in the last year of primary school, um, my, my school uh, hosted a uh, musical. And that year, the musical uh, that was chosen for us to perform was The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And <laughs> I got to be, I got to fully express myself by um, going for one role in the musical and getting it. And if you're familiar with the Disney version of the movie, I was Laverne the Gargoyle, the one that has a Southern American accent, uh, who I think is meant to be like kind of in her. 60s, 70s, and has like birds following her all the time. Um, obviously, I could relate to Laverne in lots of ways when I was 12, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I put on the, the uh, accent for my audition. Uh, teachers loved it. Went on to perform, I think we did a show like every night for a week, and they were all sold out in my small town in Cork. <laughs> it was it was so great to be able to express ourselves, me and the other uh, kids in my class. 
Um, I know that it really encouraged a lot of people to go on and do lots of more creative things in the arts. Um, I'm not going to give you an impression or a reading from that just now because um, <laughs> I uh, I would never regain <laughs> I would never regain um, your respect. I think so. That's that's where I come in. Um, any other very good school experiences you'd like to talk about? Also very open to talking about the harder ones that are definitely definitely relatable. Um, I think my school experiences are probably not that relatable. Um, I went to a convent school um, with recently incorporated boys. We had one way, one way corridors and one way systems and a grand staircase that only nuns and teachers were allowed down. And we played wide games that were all about being all religious. They were about us sort of like, we started off in hell, which was the tennis court, and then we had to go to a priest to get a life which was a piece of string. And then we had to run to the donkey field, which was a field with an actual donkey in, where we get paired with a saint and then we'd have to try and run to Jerusalem whilst minions would try and take us away from the saint. And um, whilst playing that game, I got, I fell into a ditch, got covered in sticky weed and a nun trying to figure out how to get the sticky weed off me without getting it stuck to her, hosed me down with cold water. Oh no. Oh no. So yeah. That's like a good and a bad experience. Kind of <laughs> as well. Um, I mean, it's a great feeling. Uh, feelings whilst I was being held down by a nun. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. I love that. I mean, well, you were saying that your school experiences weren't that relatable, but actually, like, I also went to. It wasn't quite a convent school, but I did go to uh, all girls christian high schools like since well i went to a christian primary school which had boys and then from when i was like 13 i went to all girls boarding school and like didn't speak to a boy for like six years and then like my parents are shocked that i like girls like i don't know what what you were doing <laughs> but um but yeah um so we used to i remember like all girls christian boarding school we had we had school from monday to saturday and then you had to get up and go to church on sunday mornings and um obviously we used to try and get out of this every way we possibly could so by the sixth form we'd learned that um they so they'd come around the like matrons would come around every sat every su sunday morning to come and like make sure that you were like up and on your way to church and so um we realized that if we hid in our wardrobes during the matron's checks, then they wouldn't know you were in your room because they'd just open the door and like, look. And um, so you could get out of going to church, but then you had to stay in your room and be really, really quiet for the two hours that everyone else was at church so that you wouldn't be caught. Um, so we do that or we'd, we'd either do that or try and sneak out of house and go to Starbucks on a Sunday morning. So if you went into the Starbucks in the town um, on any given Sunday morning, you'd find it absolutely chock full of boarding school girls who were escaping church because it was the closest coffee shop to, to school, but that wasn't on school campus. So um, yeah, that was, that was my Christian all girls boarding school experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's so interesting to hear that like being really quiet and sitting still in a closet is better than being really quiet and sitting still in a church. I think that oh, says a lot. You, can, you only need to stay in the closet for about 15 minutes while they do the rounds. So you just take a book and a torch and, and, and that's far more interesting than sitting in church and being told that you're all going to go to hell. <laughs> yeah. I just love the symbolism of it being a closet as well, just on that other yeah. level. I just... The irony is, is rich. Yeah. Is oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was me. Um, school was pretty good though. I, like, I enjoyed school. Like, I was very, well, the irony is even richer because I was deeply in the closet. Um, like, I knew I was queer of some description. Um, from when I was probably like 15. I, I knew when I was like 15 or 16, but I wouldn't admit it to myself until I left school. And then I didn't really come out, come out until like 
the first year of uni, like after the first year of uni. So uh, yeah, mostly it was good, but I was also very regressed. Being a at all girls boarding school tends to do that to you. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's definitely not all kind of sunshine and rainbows. I think we can agree on that. And um, I know that uh, Winnie has just left a uh, comment in uh, the chat. Winnie, great to hear that you smash your fun year music evening. Um, I'm sure you got like a similar feeling to me uh, smashing my gargoyle impression. Um, but obviously, yeah, uh, it seems that Catholicism or kind of Christianity is actually a lot more common amongst us than I was expecting. Um, I think being the um, token Irish person, uh, maybe there's more Irish people here. I thought I was going to have all of the good uh, Catholic childhood stories, but um, clearly I don't have anything as, as exciting as uh, the hosing down or the um, Sunday Starbucks uh, dates, they sound, they sound really, <laughs> really memorable. Oh god. I just read in the chat that Siobhan's parents met as missionaries. <laughs> yeah, my well. dad left the priesthood to marry my mum. It was a big controversy and my mum was seen as a Jezebel. My mum, who met my dad when she was uh, teaching in a convent school because she was because she believed so much in the word of God. Wow, <laughs> that's love, right? Love that. Yeah. For them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So my my childhood was definitely religious. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone else like to weigh in with um, kind of school experiences, good or bad, um, Catholic or secular or otherwise spiritual? Uh, we're interested in all denominations. Um, anything to add, uh, Jimmy or um, even? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. But I went to Catholic primary school, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think uh, <laughs> um, I, I really didn't like school actually um, and one of my favorite things was was getting into trouble and I found that all, all the other people that were also a bit different really liked getting into trouble as well and so we all, all kind of got together and did that um, it was great the, the headmaster um, so if you were naughty you had to go and stand by the statue because we, we had, it was a nice Catholic school we had a statue of the Virgin Mary uh, from, from the headmaster's office, if you're naughty, you had to go and stand there. And at one point, he poked me in in the I don't know what you call that bit in the trachea, and said, "You're an evil little boy." So that was nice. Um, <laughs> um, I think my favourite thing about school, apart from getting into trouble, which was quite good fun, um, was music. Um, yeah like whether it was choir, e even if it was religious songs, it's still... In secondary school and, and I went to sixth form college and it was just something that people could bond over without having to actually speak to each other. Uh, and so you kind of bypass all of the rubbish <laughs> that people talk about when they're that age, you know. Um, I, I found that quite a... Uh, it was a good bonding experience, yeah. To build build friendships off of that. I think uh, Kathy's having some issues, maybe with her camera right now. Does oh, there she's back. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> folks. My um, my collaborate just crashed on me. Um, but I got most of that, Jimmy. Um, yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of commonalities across the board. Um. Any more interesting chat questions or chat comments just now? It seems that there were a lot of us were Catholic at school, went to Catholic <laughs> school. That seems to be a, a, a trend. And we grew up uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Sabine, Sabine has suggested that uh, compulsory Catholicism makes us bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> I can buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's science behind that. Someone needs to look into that, I think. 
someone's next research project. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, is it a good time to move on to question four? How do you feel, Lindsay? Yeah, I'm ready if everybody else is. Yep. Yeah. Um, again, and this is, I don't think anybody has specifically said that they don't want to participate, but if you don't, obviously you don't have to. Um, so this one is, do you ever have to conceal any aspects of your personal life? And if so, can you give us an example? Kathy, do you want to start if you can think of anything or just to go to the interviewees? Hmm, this is one that I, the one that I did not prepare. <laughs> um, <laughs> Give me a second. I Does can, anyone else I, I have? Yes. I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've, I'm in that weird position of I've been in a relationship with a male since I was 17. We went to school together. Uh, everybody knows us as a couple, everything like that. I wasn't out as bi before we got together. So obviously it's that strange kind of straight passing where nobody quite realizes. So. Uh, I then went on to do a gender studies degree and wrote an entire thesis about bisexuality and everybody was very much like, oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. What, what inspired that choice? And then obviously you have to like unravel that entire conversation. And it's that strange thing where I wasn't necessarily concealing it about myself. It was more just difficult to bring up the conversation when, like you've said before, like, in straight passing relationships it's sometimes difficult to breach that topic mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah totally <laughs> um yeah i think i think uh, a lot of us will have that in common as well um i know i do in that i um was you know actively dating uh guys or people who identified as, as uh, men uh from like early adulthood and um j just kind of was aware of uh, being bisexual, I think, but um, felt, felt like I hadn't uh, proven it, <laughs> which uh, which maybe other people can relate to. Um, I'm, I'm reminded kind of on that topic that I guess um, and the aspect, like my, my sexuality is probably the aspect that I conceal from some people. And while I try to be like vocal and like kind of a, an ambassador for the uh, straight passing femme boys as much as I can, um, there are like some people in my life who like might kind of, it might take a bit for them to wrap their head around the concept. I'm thinking, for example, of my 85 year old grandmother, um, who is one of the few of us who really held strong to her Catholic beliefs and you know i uh love her to bits and she really loves me but um i've i've found that like especially moving to a new country um i'm i'm learning about new aspects of myself since moving here and i'm getting to know a fantastic queer community i'm able to be really open about my queerness and then when i go back to ireland small town ireland um i find that those things aren't always congruent with people's everyday lives so, and that it's just sometimes easier to go along with them believing that I'm straight. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. Yeah, so I have a very similar story, I guess. Um, like, so I went to, yeah, I went to these like Christian high schools. Well, actually, okay, the first point to make is probably that I was raised in a very, very, not Christian, but very, very religious household. Um, and so I, rem I, I remember having, com this is probably more on the family question, which I think comes next, but um, yeah, I, I had three conversations ever <laughs> about like gay people with my dad during my life and none of them were good. So, um, so it, uh, there was that. And then there was also the fact that I'm half Irish myself. And so my mum's side of the family are all, uh, we're all, my, my nan was very, very Catholic. And then my aunts and uncles are Catholic to varying degrees. So there's a couple who I'm very close to that I am out to. But yeah, it's one of those where when I like go and see all my like Irish family at home, like it's not something I bring up. And yeah, they know that 
him dating a boy and they've met him and they think he's great and it's just easier to kind of pretend I'm straight um and it's I always kind of feel it's a bit of a shame because I feel like I'm very vocal about my bisexuality like in my life like with my friends with my work I like go to events I talk to people like I make this very obvious um but I can't do that when I go home and it's um it always makes me uncomfortable and especially when like you hear like people talking about the gays or like whatever uh, there's I guess trans rights and stuff is in the news a lot now so that's a conversation that comes up and it's always like guess I'm just gonna sit here with my mouth shut or you say weird stuff because otherwise it's just gonna be uncomfortable for everyone <laughs> um so yeah it's uh it's something like I remember someone saying once or I remember hearing um that like coming out isn't a one-time event it's a like lifelong process where you have to make that decision yeah every time individually based on who you're talking to or the situation you're in or the environment you're in and that's something you feel a lot when it's like yeah my like old catholic aunt who like it just doesn't feel like constructive to bring that aspect of my life to them so yeah that, i feel like there's often people that you conceal this from i don't know that's just me i i think i'm quite lucky in that i don't sorry but yeah I, I get that I'm I'm also vocally bisexual and I've started being vocally bisexual everywhere with everyone <laughs> and for each of all you're you're inspiring I'm I'm trying to be, <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to be that way too. It, it it's it's um it's also um interesting because um it's made my parents i i didn't really because i because i'm so vocally bisexual i hadn't realized i hadn't come out to my parents um so um um I, christmas dinner christmas breakfast one morning i just casually i was like oh it's like when i was dating this girl and she was from she was from sunderland i didn't want to say that she was a geordie because i had a feeling she was from sunderland and everyone in the family was just like yes yes when you were dating that girl and my mum was like what what what's going on and i realized that my mom didn't know and then she got quite upset that i hadn't been able to tell her and she got really drunk and complained to my sister-in-law that she was like is this why she's not telling me about people she's dating is it because is it because she thinks that i don't understand and i'm like well you did call my aunt a duck um when we were teenagers which is not a good thing to do in front of your um your, your actually queer daughter um but um my aunt my aunt actually loves being known as that now she's she's lesbian and she's reclaimed that word i just feel it's important to say but that wasn't how my mum was using it yeah no i totally get it uh siobhan um i i don't know if if other people can relate but i guess some words might still be a little hard to hear so it might be worth kind of oh yeah apologies thinking. Thinking about our, thinking about words. No, I'm I'm trying to do it as well uh, all day today because I know that you know some things can be more painful than others. Um, but yeah, I I think you know we're familiar with those terms most of us. Um, and uh, yeah, you I, I think people can't imagine um, maybe maybe in that situation that they they can't imagine uh, a kind of a, a situation. Oh my god. Sorry, uh, they, uh, they, I guess they want their child to have an easy life. So they're like, uh, oh, well, you, you look like you like boys now when you're 12, so you're just going to keep liking boys, right? And then a comment like that comes out because they think uh, they don't fully understand you, and maybe you're still learning yourself, you know? Um, that's, that's kind of the time that, that that understanding is happening. It's kind of a crucial time, and I think it's a time that parents nowadays are definitely trying to be more understanding and open in conversation with young people, you know, when trying to say like things like, I hear my aunt saying to my to my nephew, like, oh, anyone you have a crush on at school and it's not necessarily gendered. And that's really nice to hear, you know, that that didn't really happen uh, for me, I know. Um, 
sexy for me as a mother as well with two young young ones I've actually found it's it's been easier to discuss with them my bisexuality than it ever has been with any of my other family members kids you know just get it (laughs) they do and they don't Um, have any preconceived ideas they don't have any you know these profound things that people used to come out with when I was at school the things that you know about bisexuality would be you'd be associated being called you know you're greedy or you're confused or it's a phase all this kind of rubbish that sticks in your head for years and years but talking to my children they just listen and they mm-hmm. just go yeah okay so when we talk about we we do what you were just saying there Kathy we make sure we're very much and um, we talk about one day you'll fall in love with a person we, we try and gender neutralize everything we talk about you fall in love with a person you might get married to a person we never ever use sort of the binary language i'm just reading all the chat about people's kids and their sexuality and stuff and gender kids just get it like it's nice <laughs> talking to kids about this stuff is easy talking to adults about it is hard <laughs> It probably uh, leans into kind of other, um, you know, ideas that kids form early on that they they are very open to everything, and that you know, um, when when you see kids grow up to have certain opinions or like strong beliefs that might be um, kind of othering or outgrouping, it's it's learned, you know, because they they want to learn as much about the world from you and from the people who are influencing them as as possible so like uh those of us who are engaging with young people or who have the opportunity to do so are doing such a a a great thing by um by doing these things that georgia mentioned and like being able to say you know you'll fall in love with a person when you grow up that's really nice to hear from me personally Did anyone, I just wanted to jump in with a quick question because we're talking about like stereotypes earlier and things like that. Has anyone else been experienced, um, especially when, um, around bigger groups, bigger social groups, and especially if you're parties or there's drink involved? Um, if you call it like a positive stereotype or not, but I don't think it's particularly positive that being a bisexual woman, you're somehow you know it's, it is about the sex and it's about you're really flirty or you know you're you know it's it's quite a, a kind of there's there's this persona that people used to put out and now I think that that's yeah. just so that can be really really negative does that make yeah, sense I'm struggling with my words <laughs> we've fetishized no, we've that's fetishized. it yeah that's it, it. it yeah it's if you're bisexual and you're a woman that means that you are very sexual and it also somehow means you're super available to men Mm -hmm. yes like like if you're with women you're doing it like like the whole idea is that you're doing it for men but then also bisexual Mm -hmm. men how often are they told that they're secretly gay it's like Mm -hmm. no matter if you're bisexual it doesn't matter who you fancy you secretly fancy men Mm -hmm. yeah cis Mm -hmm. men is Uh, is what you're into (laughs) And also, like, as much, so, like, all of the, like, oh, bisexuals, like, like to sleep with everyone, and they like to sleep around, and all of this, like, that's really harmful as well, but also, like, if you like those things, and you're bisexual, like, that's fine, too, like, just because, just because I like sex, and I'm bisexual does not, like, those two things aren't connected, (laughs) those two things are separate, and they are just happen to be different aspects of what I'm what you like what you're into like it doesn't mean like you're a bad bisexual for holding up stereotypes if you are like someone yes. that like yeah. a sleep around or someone that's in a polyamorous relationship or someone that like all of these other things like that's something I struggled with for a long time was like oh great I've like found this this sexuality and I'm like comfortable with that and I've come to terms with that so like let's go out and do stuff and then people would like say oh well it's because you're bisexual and it's like no like mm-hmm. I just I just like hookups I mean I've been in a relationship for ages now but it's like just because you like hookups doesn't mean you're bad bisexual and 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 also um it's uh, uh as one of my friends posted today liking threesomes 
isn't necessarily a bisexual thing, but also liking them doesn't make you a bad bisexual. Um, uh, and I want to use this time to say the best thing that someone ever said on a date. I went on a date with this incredibly beautiful man once and it he high fived me because we were both bisexual and English was his second language. And so how he phrased it was this. Just because I am bisex does not mean I like triangles. <laughs> <laughs> which is my favourite thing ever. That is super useful. Um, I'd, I'd love to um, check in with Jimmy just now that we're talking about the stereotypes that affect men as well. Um, Jimmy, we have talked a little bit there about um, the, the stereotypes that women experience a lot. What Are there some of those that you recognise that affect women predominantly? Um, as opposed to men? I don't know. I'm really naive about stereotypes. <laughs> um, are there any... Um, like the, the, the original question was, um, do you ever conceal any aspect of your personal life? And I'm too naive to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the same time, I don't know. I, that's Sorry, really you were, were going to ask something else. No, you're good. That's a really interesting and like varied answer to that question, that you feel like it's not something that you do very much. Um, and that's that's really interesting, too. Um, especially uh, with your context, you talk about having kids and having been in a relationship, did you say, for more than 20 years? And it's something yeah. you guys have been open about the whole time? Uh, I mean, it, it, it doesn't come up very often, you know? <laughs> um there there was that five minutes when when johnny depp was hot but you know um that that was a, a moment and it passed <laughs> my, my, my mother-in-law had, had flinched when i said that <laughs> but, uh, yeah um i i don't know um yeah i guess it's it's the kind of um, the privilege of, of passing for straight a lot of the time mm. means that I don't encounter a lot of these things. Um, yeah, I think that's something yeah, that I suppose also, most of us have in common um, uh, who are on the, the panel just now, that straight passing is is a theme that is, and, and it's a privilege, as you say, for sure. Yeah, it's it's also like, it's also a bit obstructive to self-discovery, I think, um, because, you know, yeah. Like you, you feel like you're, you're ex because you're not presenting the other side of yourself. You can't express it freely. You know, there's that that aspect to it as well. And so I was quite, I was really naive about all of this stuff growing up, and so I didn't really identify as anything. Um, and it it took a long time to to realize that I was different in a lot of ways. You know, um, and by then I'd already had this life built up around me and you know what, what do you do with that when people expect you to be a certain way and well you know i, I wear leggings <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um yeah <laughs> um uh, thank you for thanks for pitching in on that um i know that we have one question left and i'm conscious that we have um, about 10 minutes left, so it would be great to um, go to that in, in some in some small bit of detail uh, in that I'm really interested to hear if anyone has any interesting coming out stories. Um, yeah, uh, Siobhan, as you say with your mum, <laughs> it was quite uh, unconventional in that it came up at Christmas breakfast and you kind of assumed that she knew. Um, do any of you guys or anyone who's in the audience um, have any similar uh, experiences that it just kind of um, gradually crept into the consciousness of your loved ones uh, or was it a big moment? I'd love to hear what that was like. My yeah, uh, I guess, partner. Yeah. Oh, no, give me <laughs> Jimmy, go ahead. Go. Please. I'm on the panel. People go first. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess with with my mum, it was quite interesting um, because she's uh, um, 
well i guess she's not quite sure what she is either <laughs> um uh, uh, she identifies as demisexual um but maybe like the gender of her partner is completely irrelevant to her i think um uh, and so yeah she's kind of discovered that over the past couple decades the same as i have and we've had open discussions about this as we've discovered these things so we've not really come out it's just sort of evolved you know <laughs> it's quite yeah. nice i guess it, it builds on what zara was saying earlier about that coming out is a constant experience i totally relate to that and zara you made you made a really interesting point i know we were comparing and uh, Siobhan being loud and proud, which is fantastic, but also that to be careful with yourself and to make sure that you're comfortable and that the people around you are comfortable. Sometimes there's a decision to be made when you when you feel like uh, it's right or not the right moment, uh, which I totally understand. Anyone else who wants to chip in on? Uh, I can go, but my coming out stories aren't particularly fun. <laughs> um, they're not great stories. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned earlier that like my my family were very religious growing up. So um, my <laughs> so my mom passed away when I was a little kid, and my dad became even more religious as a result. Oh, there's a cat. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Uh, Galaxy uh, has decided to join us. Oh, <laughs> I love Galaxy. Sorry. Attention um, was going sorry, to her, Continue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So very religious. Um, uh, like queerness wasn't a thing we talked about at all. And the hand, the the couple of times it came up, it was it was not good. Um, so I yeah I hid I I kind of acknowledged my own sexuality when I was like somewhere between fifteen and seventeen, probably closer to the seventeen end um but like i didn't come out to like my friends or like anything until i was uh 19. um and even then i only came out to my dad two years ago and we haven't spoken since <laughs> so that's where that's at and like it's it's not yeah he he didn't take that very well and like the worst part is is that like i'm <laughs> i'm currently seeing a boy so it's like of all the <laughs> of all the things but um and he wasn't happy with that either for other reasons but um it's all a bit from him but um yeah i mean he's he's a dick so it's fine like everyone's in the chat like oh my god i'm sorry it's, it's fine he's a twat like this is very much like my my call um but um yeah no it was just like i i kind of waited until it was the right time but like i had like the first girl that i ever like loved like we she was my best friend for years and then we dated and like that was all in secret like keeping it from my parents because like they couldn't know about that i wouldn't have been like safe or sensible um so yeah that was that was me um and like i've come out to other family members like other like Catholic family members and most of them are like they're nice about it but they're also kind of the kind of people who forget um so like talking about like my ex-girlfriends was very uncomfortable with them but then the minute I like bring a boy they're like oh my god he's amazing this is fantastic when's the wedding and I'm like oh okay okay guys I see how it is um so there's like periodic reminders to like the family i'm very close to um where i'm like oh yeah i'm going to my gay workshop with my gay book club with my gay friends and they're like oh why and i'm like because i'm queer <laughs> um just like six monthly reminder there that that's the thing um so yeah like coming out was definitely like an event for me it was very much like i had to sit these people down and be like this is the tea um but yeah it was it was a it was a great process but i've done it now so like everyone i everyone i needed to know knows and now i'm just like ridiculously vocal about it in my life because i don't need to worry about that anymore <laughs> so uh years of repression will do that to you um but yeah that's <laughs> I've been quite, I've been kind of really, really gentle in mind. I've never really had a kind of come, I've never actually come out as such. 
Um, I've done it in like drips and, and drabs with friends and stuff because of probably what happened when I was younger. Um, having the people that you feel should be the, the first couple of people to, to support you when you're talking about things like this turn around and say oh you know you, this is just a phase and you're just doing this for attention I think it can create some kind of trauma there that you then it then translates into other parts of your life so I don't ever really say out loud to people I don't go on oh hi da 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 or I'm not I'm not uh, loud and proud I wish I was I really do and I feel it I owe it to my children to be more confident in myself it's just hard there's just a, there's still a lot of underlying issues for me. I can you know I can totally understand that, Georgia, in that you have a kind of a, a certain level of uh, protection when you're not yes. uh, shouting about it. Um, that you you don't have to be different for a little bit, and that can work out for you in certain situations. I also would like to be louder about it, but I'm still learning how to do that comfortably yeah. and you know without causing myself. Uh, more stress so um even just like participating in something like this is like so excellent and like we're so glad to have you and i think i think it, you can see that like a lot of people are in uh if not the same boat similar boats nearby yeah. <laughs> um yeah um yeah those have been uh, really interesting responses thank you folks um would anyone else like to chip in just before we finish up um in terms of uh any stories they have any kind of differences or similarities there um i was just gonna so much say to... that yeah siobhan go ahead i was just gonna say that um if i had come out earlier i don't think it would have been a good process uh, my parents had um they just didn't, they didn't get it. They used horrible slurs and stuff like that. And it was only my cousin coming out and basically going, like they basically, when they got to know his his ex-husband, they were like, oh, it, they, they relation, people, people who are gay can have relationships. Like it hadn't occurred to them that it was anything other than a, a sex thing until they saw, saw him and his relationship and they saw my aunt who came out and her her relationship. And um, when they when when my dad had a trans colleague, he still uses problematic language to describe trans people, but he he, he doesn't object. He his his all his about what trans people are like when he still has stereotypes about by people which is unfortunate for me but they are they're 72 and the fact that they've been able to come round to this it was like in their 60s then they stopped being as prejudiced and um but if i'd come out as a teenager they'd have told me that i was wrong um and that it didn't exist and that i was wrong and that it was bad and that if I could choose, couldn't I just choose men and all this stuff? But I came out in my, I came out to them in my thirties when they couldn't tell me that I was wrong because I disagree and they, yeah, they'd, they'd, they'd come a long way. Yeah, of course. And, you know, we all know other like members of the LGBT plus community who've, yeah, um, had their kind of identities dismissed in that way and who have protected themselves by coming out later on or, you know, still not coming out or still thinking about it. Um, and I really want to explain that more, but I'm so distracted by your beautiful cats. <laughs> um, yes, they override any point I was trying to make uh, with their I think we've got a lot of cast fans tuned in today. Um, before we wrap up, would anyone else like to weigh in on uh, anything mentioned just there again? I really like the the point about um, uh, relationships being a thing when someone kind of gets their head around bisexuality that maybe it's about relationships and not all about sex. Like it takes a while to get to that sometimes. 
before before I go, I just wanted to to say I think that um honestly I wouldn't I wouldn't be even be able to sit here and be happy to talk about any of this um without the um support of my husband. I really think that he's he's got me to kind of for the for the first time in my entire life feel comfortable in myself and look at myself not as anyone who's 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 been wrong or or, or whatever. He's he's always been there to for me to discover things about myself and and just be like yes and that's you and I love you for who you are and it's just been incredible that makes me so happy I was gonna say like I felt like I ended on quite a, or like I I stopped there on quite a like depressing note but the the um, message I want to tell everyone is that like coming like coming to terms with your own like sexuality and sexual identity and other identities as well is like a process and everyone's at a different stage of that process and like other people in your life are at different stages of that process as well so like for someone like my parents like I know because of other reasons they they're probably not going to get there but for like most people in your life that you will encounter like a lot of people just don't know or don't understand so it just takes some time but like I'm really proud of everyone for being on their journeys and like doing their thing <laughs> and like everyone's going to be yeah. at different stages but that's okay and no one needs to come out to anyone if they don't want to it's not like a compulsory part of your sexuality is coming out if if you want yes. to be visible be visible if you don't want to be visible you don't have to be you don't have to be it yet you don't have to be ever everyone can take their time and get get to it when they want and have that, that, to, to, to finish off your thoughts <laughs> yes i agree that's Thanks. very true and very important so Do for any of my family that didn't already know um my uh my best man pretty much very lightly veiled in a joke outed me in, in our during our wedding <laughs> and actually, at the time i didn't realize you know yeah, there we are that is, it is um i just wanted to say as well like it, it, where other people are in their journeys can have a uh, and their reaction to you can have a big influence on whether you move forwards or not so i just remembered like mm -hmm. um when i just started uni and Find my mum, the rest of my family had moved to Australia and um oh what's what's news? Oh I kissed a guy, you know. What? <laughs> you know, oh, if she had been wow. later on her game, her response would have been um wouldn't have been something like, Oh, it's just a phase or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so so they like kind of kind of bottled that away again at that stage, you know um mm. <laughs> but yeah um so i guess that's why it was so gradual yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. it's, 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 all, it's all good now it's fine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um yeah that's um I, I hope that's um a similar situation for a lot of people who are tuned in today you know that you're you feel like you're on a stage in, in a journey and that you don't have to be at a certain point by a certain time um that you don't have to address the hard things all at once that um you have a community hopefully that we feel like a community that are um supportive and i know that i felt really supportive on this call and i just want to thank our interviewees and my my co-chair lindsay at this moment to say thank you so much this has been really really uh wholesome i've really enjoyed this and i felt really seen and supported. I hope you guys feel the same. Very nice. Oh, we've got flags. I've got a flag that's in the other room. <laughs> Now's a great time to fly your flag if you have one. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> I have a tiny one. <laughs> oh, I've got a very nice. I've got that pen. Um, just to say as well, Katie has mentioned in the chat, uh, we'd love to get your feedback on this event. Um, I'm going to add a couple of notes in the chat with some links as well to um, some more staff pride network resources and uh, point you to actually maybe some of my, my colleagues might be able to do that. And um, we'll also point you to our story Scotland so you can find out more about them and uh, contribute to their research, which would be fantastic if uh, answering these questions has made you feel like 
I, I'd like to be part of this community. I'd like to, um, you know, help, help this to continue supporting other people. You know, that's, that's what we're trying to do today. So I hope, I hope you feel the same. Um, if anyone would like to ask any particular questions or would like to kind of um, debrief about this event, please feel free to send us an email. I'm going to drop the email address for the staff by networking here as a first point of contact. But um, obviously, you can be in touch with myself and Lindsay as well. Um, is there anything I'm forgetting, um, Lindsay, Katie, anyone? I don't think so. I'll just want to say that thank you for letting Our Story Scotland take part in another Pride Network event. We love doing it too, that I've taken part in. And yeah, obviously, like it's all about collecting stories and making sure people hear them. So if anything, that catches your interest on either our story scotland's website or anything that i've said tonight please don't hesitate to get in touch like we're working out weird and wonderful ways to conduct interviews in this weird lockdown covid times and it's actually it would be really nice to experiment with different ways especially from bi plus voices because that's kind of the ones that are lacking the most i would say in their archives and we've had such lovely discussions tonight so if anybody's interested in it i'd really appreciate it but yeah that's all from me thank you so much for participating guys thank you thank you thank you again to everyone i think we'll leave it at that um thanks katie fly that flag for us please please continue to do so <laughs> and have a great um, night. we'll sign off now have a good evening everyone thanks for joining in bye bye, bye guys